is just outrageous. How's it going guys? I'm Josh. I'm here with very talented food photographer Alexa. Hi, Alexa here from Eating NYC. And today we are going to be covering food photography for beginners. We'll be starting with four popular food photography methods, hitting some restaurants to demonstrate said methods, and then going over a couple quick editing tactics. Alexa, what do you shoot with? I shoot with my iPhone, which a lot of people are usually surprised about. I am more of a DSLR shooter. However, I don't have as much of a background in food photography, and if you look at her Instagram, it's hard to tell if she shoots with an iPhone. It's actually all very, very good stuff. Thank you. So, she's gonna be our culinary expert talking about, I've seen you rearrange foods at restaurants. Gets and pretty crazy. It's incredible. <laughs> and I'll talk about the technical stuff with shooting with the DSLR, and collectively, we will teach you how to take photos of food. Everything you need to know, crash course. <laughs> One big preface I want to give before we dig into this is today we're going to be focusing mostly on restaurant photography. Now, food photography is a massive genre, lots of cooking your own food. So we can focus purely on the photography, we're going to have restaurants do the cooking for us. And shooting in restaurants can sometimes look a little bit obnoxious. Just a fair warning. And on that note, <laughs> let's get started with method one. Method one. The aerial angle. <laughs> and how would you describe the aerial angle? Well, that is really like an overhead bird's eye view of the table. The aerial angle is one of the most popular angles for food photography. It's also right. most beautiful when you have a whole big table stacked full of tons of stuff. And it's fairly simple taking the actual photo. I'd say the composition is what's challenging for this. When you do have a whole table full of food, you're usually eating with a lot of people. It's kind of a lot of things at play, right? First, it's setting up the table, getting everyone to be patient so when you're at a restaurant and all the food's at the table. Mm -hmm. That's hard. You know, you're really kind of causing a production. It's not just taking a picture of one dish. So I want to get someone grabbing something with their hand. You know, I want someone cutting something with their fork. I want to kind of... And do you direct that? You say, you do this, you do this. When I can. When I'm eating with other food, Food Instagrammers, everyone mm. kind of understands that they're not going to eat until the food is cold. As people are eating, I'll always take some candids also. A little bit of iPhone versus DSLR stuff. The iPhone naturally has a focal length of about 29 or 30 millimeters. So what that means is it is pretty wide of a camera. And if you want to get that nice aerial shot on a DSLR, you're going to need either a very, very wide lens or to be standing on the tallest stool. So, so when you're deciding between iPhone versus DSLR, think about the range of lenses you have. And don't be afraid to use your iPhone because obviously it can get you some really, really nice stuff. If you don't have a wide angle, save yourself a lot of money and use, use the iPhone. But if you are an elite photographer, there is a really interesting device for your tripod called the horizontal camera mount. And what it can do is actually extends your tripod out horizontally so you can get those perfect aerial shots with the tripod. Now the merits to using a tripod for this sort of thing over going handheld with the DSLR is the fact that you're probably gonna be inside with low light situations, but you still wanna have full control over your shutter speed, aperture, and ISO and you don't wanna to have to pump your ISO way up too high. With the horizontal camera mount, you can bring your ISO super low down, ISO 100 even, and shoot with a super slow shutter speed to give you full control over your aperture. Aperture is definitely the biggest, most important variable. Um, yes, definitely. Because whether you wanna show all the meal super sharp, versus the shallow depth of field, only the front of it is super sharp. You've got options, and tripods will definitely give you a lot more flexibility here. The downside of all this camera equipment in a restaurant? Well, if you do bring a tripod, it's quite a lot of equipment to be walking into a restaurant with, so. You have to really want that overhead shot. Honestly, I'd say overhead camera mount is more like you've been hired by the restaurant to shoot. If you're just doing this, like, now I really get it. The subtlety is, is appreciated. Would you say that you have to have a certain lack of shame to do restaurant photography? Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, even if I'm in a dark restaurant, it's like I'm gonna pull out a flashlight, so I have to kind of just not care and do it. I try to be subtle and quick. Method two is food <laughs> in the air. What is food in the air photography? Kind of like what it sounds. It's taking an item of food, usually ice cream or a burger, something that you can easily hold up or like a noodle pull. It's really fun to do in the summer if you're outdoors or somewhere with a pretty backdrop and you can kind of really create a scene of where you are. And It's also great for certain dishes when you want to actually isolate part of it because it doesn't look good as a whole. So with the noodle pull you get to really see 
the shape and the length of the noodles as opposed to just this massive stringy stuff. The mechanics of getting the shot. I have really mastered this one, I think. You kind of have to hold the food in one hand, but it's much easier if you have someone, especially if you're doing like a noodle dish, you know, someone holding the noodle, pulling it up, and then you taking the picture. If you're gonna do this by yourself, I would say you probably want a very wide angle lens or the iPhone. If you're doing this with other people and you can actually be the photographer, I'd say the 50 millimeter 1.8 is a really great cheap option for shooting a nice sort of the same thing as a portrait now some things to think about here do you focus on the food or the face i would say the food right yeah do you have to think about how much blur you want on the background you don't want to have the person so out of focus that you can't even tell they're a person think about having your aperture very like a, a small number you know 1.8 2.2 but if it gets too low like i was shooting some the other day at f1.2 and it was actually just too shallow. And even with the actual food itself, I found that it was, it was sort of distracting and you couldn't see as much of the food as I wanted you to be able to see. Right, so, you definitely want that depth for sure. I want to hear about portrait mode. When do you use portrait mode versus no portrait mode? I use it for pretty much anything other than an overhead shot. Mm -hmm. um, I do use it for overhead if it's kind of like a smaller, you know, maybe two dishes overhead, but it really works best for creating depth. But it's also called the depth effect. Definitely foods like tobo pasta, a burger, mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't work as well with something flat like pizza. Portrait mode or depth effect versus is just a shallow depth of field with the DSLR. Portrait mode is actually digitally imposed. It's not real shallow depth of field. And with that comes a couple of short ends. So for example, you can't get real bokeh with the portrait mode. If you're shooting with the DSLR, bokeh is super feasible with these shots, especially indoor and you have lots of cool lighting behind. This might be when the DSLR really shines. Lighting is the most important. So in a restaurant, you want to sit, ask them to be seated somewhere by a window with natural mm -hmm. light. Such. But the worst thing is when you have those fluorescent lights that create shadows. Also, something I learned from Alexa, if you go to lots of hype New York food spots where people love to Instagram their foods, it's probably on Instagram. So you can actually learn how the dishes look yes. and scroll through. We went to this restaurant, Beau Cafe, and they had thousands probably, right, of Instagram dishes. Well, you could probably find anything on the menu and see, okay, like this is a good way to shoot it. This looks absolutely repulsive and know yes. what you wanted to go for. And method number three, <laughs> the 45 degree angle or close up food photography. What is that? That can be a lot of things. That goes really well with foods with a lot of depth sandwiches, tall balls of pasta. For Instagram, that can often mean a lot of food porn, right? Yeah. Like really, really up close stuff. Again, another thing that works really well with portrait mode on the iPhone. And I'd say lighting is really, really important for these yes. photos because if you have overhead lighting, the photo looks awful, you can't see anything. But if you have properly exposed photos with interesting shadows, it becomes a whole element of composition that is very subtle and micro because you are so close up. And think about it this way, when you're doing a big overhead shot, you have so many things going on to compensate for little weaknesses. So you have the cool table, very awesome true. plating. Very when you're doing true. a close up shot, it really, really depends on having proper lighting because people yes. notice it. How do you light your photos in a dark restaurant? Like I said, I prefer not to shoot at night, mm -hmm. but when I do, I have this little handy dandy light by Amron. It's an ALM9. I got we'll it. We'll put a link to all the equipment yes. we're talking about. I ordered on down Amazon. Below. I think it was like 40 bucks. When you're eating in a dark restaurant, I think the 45 degree usually works pretty well. Just kind of put it slightly towards the front of the dish and you can still, it's really bright, but gets the job done. And how do you feel about using iPhones to light up a shot? I used to do that too, and it's not great. Too spotty, too bright. Sometimes I'd cover it with a napkin to create like kind of a warmer nice view. Nice diffused light too. Yes. Usually I get my iPhone in position, like I know what I'm gonna, the shot I'm gonna get. Mm -hmm. Once the camera's in position, I'll quickly flash on the light, take the photo, turn it off. Uh -huh. Quick and efficient. A couple little DSLR things. A big popular lens for this would be a macro lens, in which case you can get a nice super shallow up the field and get super close up and see that fine detail. One thing you have to watch here though is when you're shooting in restaurants, you have very low lighting and you're probably gonna have to bring your aperture numbers down just a little bit if you're not using a tripod. So I have a 24 to 105 zoom lens 
and it's an f4 lens that's the lowest possible aperture number you can get to and i'd say depth of field wise f4 is perfectly fine but if you're shooting handheld it might be a little bit too slow of a lens for this sort of style of photography having a nice fast lens and fast just means it can go to a very low aperture number like 2.8 1.8 is really really helpful here unless you want to be obnoxious and use a tripod and finally that brings us to method number four Food and portraiture. Just shooting portraits that incorporates food. Really, really simple. There is no clear guideline for how to do this because it's just portraiture. You can do a million different things. Camera wise, I'd recommend this is where a real DSLR really wins out because you can use all kinds of lenses. Quick portraiture tip to make sure you have optimal lighting. There's a little trick I like to do with the hand. So when you're outside, you want to have the light nicely hitting the person's face. So take your hand out and just sort of walk around in a circle until you see the light is hitting it in the nicest way. Um, and that's the way you want your subject to be standing facing the camera. Another thing, just from a branding perspective, I've seen a lot of food accounts do no face stuff, which is interesting because I think once you open it up to portraiture work, you build way more of a natural personality. You know, same for YouTube and all this stuff, like that seems to really resonate with people. So I'd suggest having a face and using it. So I have a question for you actually. So if someone wants to start using a DSLR camera, but they don't want to buy all these lenses and equipment, what would be the one thing that you would recommend that they should have? I talk about this all the time. I'm so obsessed with it. The 50 millimeter 1.8, it's the cheapest lens. It's a great first or second lens to use and just the fact that it's so fast at f1.8 really allows you to get shooting in super low light situations use that nice shallow depth of field which is optimal for portraiture because you can blur the background and it looks really professional the last thing i'm going to say here is keep an eye out for my portraiture for a beginner's tutorial coming at some point. And that just about covers our four favorite methods for food photography. And now I wanna go into the editing process a little bit. I've got a few little Lightroom tips I wanna share with you because that's how I edit all my photos. And I want you to talk about how you edit on your iPhone. I use an app called Snapseed. I can do a ton of different things from cleaning up the photo, which is great for food photography, touching up things on the dish, increase brightness, saturation, contrast, highlights. And what I really like also is you can select certain pinpoints of the dish and either increase their structure, their saturation, or their brightness. So it's really like Photoshop mm -hmm. for iPhones. And so. how much is it? It's free. Wow. That's part All right. <laughs> well, if you have money to blow, I would recommend Lightroom. If you're using a DSLR, it's super crucial because you're probably gonna be shooting raw and you're gonna have a lot of editing capabilities. And if you don't have Lightroom or Photoshop, put a link down below to check it out. It really helps me out if you use that link and it doesn't cost any more than it would normally. I have two main tips. The HSL tab, Hue, Saturation, Luminance, is really, really vital for food photography, especially saturation and luminance because you can play with individual colors. So say you're shooting a photo of a bunch of stuff and you have strawberries in the beginning of the dish. You don't want to make the photo oversaturated, but you want to bring out the saturation of the strawberries, make them nice, beautifully red. Um, and you can also just adjust the shade a little bit. HSL tab is going to come through heavy on this. Another thing is clarity is really big on these images. I think bumping up For the clarity sure. makes it look really, really nice. And another thing that's really helpful, if you scroll down to the detail tab of Lightroom and then go under sharpening, and just bring up the amount to 100 or so. It's really helpful, it's subtle, but great. And that just about sums up food photography for beginners. Hopefully you guys learned as much as I did doing this video, because Alexa knows a lot that I don't, and that was, that was awesome. So, so fun, guys. Be sure to follow her Instagram, link to that right over here, Eating NYC. Follow. Yes, and I'll also put links down below. And yeah, thank you so, so much thank for doing you. this with me. This, this is, is fun. So fun. Yeah. If you guys want to see more photo tutorials, I have a bunch, a whole playlist full of them actually. You can check out right over here. I also have a website full of all my camera gear reviewed as well as prints of my best shots and all that great stuff. And link to that per usual right over here. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you eventually. Bye.